Hi, and welcome back. In our last video, we uncovered some wild genetics regarding the half-black trait. Therefore, I'm excited to return to Cross-16 and finally address the anomaly we left unresolved in Part 1, that singular half-black male amongst all his Snow White brothers. It didn't make sense at the time, but now that we've seen the evidence of chromosomal crossover events in crosses 19 and 20, I think we can finally explain exactly what happened, or at least as best as I can. For those new here, I'm Ivan. I'm documenting my journey to breed a stable, true breeding Snow White guppy line. My goal is to use this as a baseline for future experiments. And I've gotten incredibly close to that goal, but I keep running into hurdles with hidden genetics. Keeping track of these lineages gets complex. Therefore, I've mapped out the entire pedigree leading up to Cross 16 on my website. You might want to pull that up in a second tab to follow along, because the genetic history is about to get relevant. Cross 16 was a pairing between a half-black Snow White male, C9AM, and a Snow White female from Cross 11. Theoretically, the only difference between these parents was the half-black gene. Therefore, we expected the whole brood to be Snow White, but with a specific split in the half-black pattern. Based on our Punnett square analysis in part 1, we predicted that only the females would express the half-black trait, and all of the males would be the standard Snow Whites. For the most part, our actual results were surprisingly consistent with these predictions. The total brood size was about 30, and notably, they were far healthier than my struggles with crosses 15, 17, or even 18 to an extent. Now, the gender split was heavily skewed. 73% were male, leaving only 8 females. This is a significant male bias. But remember that the father, C9AM, came from a brood that was itself 85% male. Therefore, this skew might be linked to that ancestry. Now, let's look at the color phenotypes. 100% of the females were half-black Snow Whites, exactly as predicted. But here is where the rule broke. One of the males also expressed the half-black trait, a phenotype that, genetically speaking, shouldn't exist in this cross. This single anomaly represents about 4.5% of the males, and 3.3% when taking the females into account. In the last video, I threw out a few wild guesses to explain him, but it wasn't until I untangled the complex results of crosses 19 and 20 that a real answer finally clicked. In our analysis of crosses 19 and 20, we hit a wall. We had male offspring splitting into two groups, those that expressed half-black and those that didn't. But my standard predictions couldn't explain that split. Therefore, I concluded that we were dealing with a hidden subpopulation of red rose males. These weren't just carrying the gene on the X chromosome, they were carrying it on the X and the Y. I call these super half-black males and their existence is pointing towards a biological phenomenon called a crossover event. Okay, so crossover events. I won't claim to be an expert here, but I did learn a few things during this investigation that were honestly pretty neat. To understand them, we need to quickly review what actually happens during meiosis. I'm going to explain this through the lens of our specific cross-16 parents. And don't worry, we aren't going to memorize every phase name. To keep it simple, let's ignore the complex sex chromosome for a moment, and just look at a standard autosome as our example. At the very start, a cell holds genetic material from both parents. To make this easy to follow, I've color-coded them. First, the cell undergoes replication. Each chromosome creates an identical copy of itself, an attached sister chromatid. Now these pairs, one set from mom and one set from dad, have to find each other and line up perfectly down the center of the cell. But here's the part I found fascinating. Simply floating near each other isn't enough. To line up properly, the cell needs to exert tension on the chromosomes before pulling them apart. But you can't apply tension to something that isn't holding on. Therefore, one of the father's chromatids 
physically tethers itself to the exact location on one of the mother's chromatids. This connection point is called the chiasma, and it is absolutely mandatory for the process to work. Once they are locked together, the cell pulls them towards opposite ends. But because of that bond, they don't just let go. They actually break and exchange that section of DNA. Therefore, the DNA has physically crossed over. As you can see in the illustration, our black chromosome now has a white tip, and the white chromosome has a black tip. Finally, the cell splits, and then immediately divides one last time, this time without replicating. The chromosomes line up again, but now the tension is on the center point, the centromere. The centromere snaps, the chromatids fly apart, and the cell completes its division, leaving us with four unique sperm or egg cells, some of which now carry that remixed genetic code. Now here's the key. This crossover process isn't limited to just the autosomes we just looked at. It happens to all of the guppies' chromosomes, including the sex chromosomes. The mechanism is slightly different, but the outcome is the same. Genes get shuffled. So that explains the mechanistic reason for why these events happen, but it results in nature's way of ensuring genetic diversity. But simply knowing it happens isn't enough to solve our puzzle. We need to dig deeper, because the actual location of that crossover event has massive implications. Now, these crossover events don't just happen anywhere. There are specific hotspot regions where the chromosomes are more likely to break and reconnect. Let's put this in the context of specific genes. Imagine our half-black gene sits right at the very tip of the chromosome. I've color-coded the alleles here. Blue for Nigrocotitis II and green for wild type. If the chromatids link up at any of the hotspots above that gene, the tip is going to get chopped off and exchanged. Therefore, genes at the tips are practically guaranteed to swap. But let's look at the opposite. What if the gene sits way up here, hugging the central anchor point or centromere? For this gene to swap, the break would have to happen in this tiny specific space, which is statistically unlikely. Therefore, genes near the center are essentially locked in place. The rule of thumb is simple. The closer a gene is to the tip, the higher the frequency of crossing over, spanning from near 0% chance up to 100%. Sex chromosomes are a little weird. They must have a region that never crosses over. Otherwise, the male determining gene would jump to the X chromosome, and the biological gender system would collapse. But they do have a specific zone at the tip called the pseudoautosomal region, or PAR. This region behaves exactly like the regular autosome. Therefore, if a gene sits near the tip of the PAR, it is free to cross over from the Y to the X chromosome, or vice versa. Now, our gene of interest, Nigrocotitis II, sits right inside this PAR. And based on the frequency that it crosses over, we can actually estimate exactly where it lives. Luckily, I found a paper from 2008 that compiled a list of sex-linked genes and their crossover rates. This table listed Nigrocotitis II as having a 4% frequency of crossing over from the Y to the X, and strangely, 0% from the X to the Y. Therefore, since that number is low, this suggests that Nigrocotitis is actually located quite far from the volatile tip of the PAR, sitting much closer to the stable region that doesn't cross over. This 4% frequency is the magic number. It suggests that roughly 1 in 25 of C9AM's sons should inherit the half-black trait via a crossover event to the Y chromosome. And miraculously, when we look at our actual cross-16 data, our anomaly falls right within that range. Remember, he represents 3.3 to 4.5%, depending if you count him with his sisters or just his brothers. It's almost a perfect match. Now, I am a little skeptical of the paper's precision, mainly because their sample size was small, only 100 fish. But it gives us a biological precedent. Therefore, like we saw in cross 16 or cross 20, seeing a male express a trait he shouldn't have is no longer a mystery. It has some statistical backing. 
So this is a lot of heavy theory, but I don't want to leave it at just theory. I want to see if it actually happened. The best way to test if our cross-16 anomaly occurred because of a Y-linked crossover event is to pair him with a female that we know for a fact does not carry the half-black gene. Therefore, I set up cross-16. I took our anomaly male, which I labeled as C16CM, and placed him in a tank with three non-half-black females from cross-18, who are now labeled as C18AF. Here is the prediction. If my theory is correct, and this male expresses half-black because of his Y chromosome rather than his X, he will pass that Y to every single male offspring. Therefore, we expect 100% of his sons to express the half-black trait, and none of his daughters. But we also have to account for that 4% crossover frequency we just discussed. That means we are watching closely to see if 1 in 25 of his fry break the rule again. This cross is going to be fascinating to track. So expect a dedicated update video soon. But there is one more exciting possibility here. Remember, Cross20 revealed that I had red rose males carrying the half-black trait on both the X and Y chromosomes, what I'm calling super half-black males. Therefore, if I plan my crosses correctly, I should be able to replicate that genetic stack to create super half-black snow white males. Now, will they look any different? I have no idea. They might look identical to regular half-blacks. But genetically speaking, they will be unique, and I think that this is a fun side quest worth pursuing. Okay, let's return to the rest of the brood. To keep the project moving, I need to set up new crosses. I want to avoid sibling breeding, but I also need to stay as close to the Snow White phenotype as possible. This is tricky because I didn't have many pure Snow White females available. Therefore, while the next generation won't be 100% pure, the brood should be limited to just two phenotypes, making future selection much easier. First, the females. I've already paired C16AF with the father of cross 18, C11BM, to create cross 21. I rushed this pairing because I was worried about losing that male late in the summer, and I really wanted to preserve his specific topside iridescence. They've already dropped several batches of fry. Next is cross 22. I paired female C16BF to a snow white male from cross 18, who I labeled as C18AM. This cross is special. It was designed to finally combine the genetic material from all four of my original starting females into one brood. Plus, I'm hoping to unlock some hidden iridescent forehead genes from the cross 18 line. Now for the males. I selected two best brothers based on finage and body form, C16AM and C16BM. One is being paired with an F1 red rose hybrid female from cross 19 to create cross 23. The other gets a female from cross 20 to create cross 24. Now I know that is a lot of numbers, but the goal here is to eventually establish a spiral breeding system. This will allow me to maintain the Snow White line indefinitely while safely bringing in new traits from side crosses. Each of these crosses will have their own video series with the exception of crosses 23 and 24, where we will be comparing the offspring to each other like we did with crosses 19 and 20. That wraps up our look at cross 16. What started as a puzzling anomaly, a half-black male where none should exist, became the key to understanding how crossover events work in my tanks. Hopefully, the science made sense, and I didn't completely butcher the theory. If you enjoyed this deep dive genetic approach to guppy breeding, subscribe so you don't miss the next update videos. The next video is on Cross 18, where I investigate why I was dead wrong on them being dull fish. Turns out they were just slow bloomers. Finally, let's wrap up with some quick updates on our other crosses. Cross 21. We have three broods on the ground, splitting into Snow Whites and Half Blacks. Auxiliary Cross 3. Still waiting on our first fry. If you missed the start of this mystery and want to see the first time that anomaly male appeared in Cross 16, check out part 1 right here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.